Let's create the gods and religions in your world. First, a minor word of warning. I'm going to be discussing some creation myths from a couple of um, the, primarily the Egyptian, and there are some, shall we say, mature topics when you talk about the creation myths of the Egyptians. So if you don't want to be offended, uh, I suggest you stop viewing now. So one of the things that you have to do when you start um, designing your pantheon or, or whatever, your list, your list of gods that are in there, you want to take a look at what aspects you uh, the gods have. Each god or goddess is going to have uh, a different set of aspects. Usually they'll have a primary aspect and some secondary, and I'll show you the ones that I used when I created the world of Tiglath. But also related to the gods is how they came into being. And Hesiod's Theogony is an example of um, a, a document that was created, was written by Hesiod, or anyway, you can argue about whether the muse moved him or whatever. That's a whole interesting discussion. But um, uh, Hesiod outlined where all the gods came from, and that's where we hear about all of them. So you have to think about this. Now, the Egyptian um, myth, and I'll put a link to one of, the, one of the gods in there, the Egyptian creation myth is a little odd, and you have to uh, decide if you're going to um, follow along something a little bit, um, shall we say, odd like their creation myth. What happens if you... Um, look at the creation myth, the first god then uh, masturbates, and that's where the other gods spring forth. So that actually has some interesting ramifications because we kn know that the, um, uh, the kings or the, uh, the, the, the pharaoh, his... Um, primary wife, he, they, had, they were a polygamist group, and the primary wife was also called the Hand of the King. And the reason she was called the Hand of the King was supposedly that they would go into the temple and she would masturbate him to simulate the creation of the world. So that's that's why I said this is a little adult and um, the, he, yeah, it get, that gets a little strange, but that's actually the way that the Egyptians dealt with that. And the interesting factor, if you've ever studied it, they I remember reading or seeing some discussion about uh, the British Museum and at the when the uh, the British archaeologists went down into Egypt and they started to lay out and they kept meticulous records. At, at first, everybody thought, well, these, these are meticulous records. That's how you do archaeology. You specify where you found it exactly. You measure everything and you record everything down there. But they were going through the uh, British Museum and they found a box uh, that was not, um, it was listed basically as miscellaneous and they were sort of curious and they opened up the box and what they found in there were all these um, phalluses. Um, and what happened was when the archaeologists first went through some of the pyramids and the Egyptian ruins, they collected many things, brought them back to the British Museum. If you've ever been to the British Museum, it's beautiful. There's lo lots of things to do there. I also encourage you, if you go to England, go to the um, uh, the War Museum, which is another, uh, the British War Museum, which is another wonderful thing if you're into that. But the British Museum is just massive and you probably want to spend multiple days just going through there. It's like going through the Smithsonian. It's massive. Uh, and I enjoy a uh, massive museum and I enjoyed doing that. I've done that when I was a young man and 
Um, but they hid or they took, a, they never recorded where they found them. And we, we don't know this. And actually a lot of the statues we find were mutilated because they uh, were not sure who did that, but they cut various, um, uh, often male genitalia off and um, nobody knows exactly what they did with them, but they were an interesting artifact. That's probably somebody in some private collections, somebody has some, shall we say, perverse ideas. But the question that when you're creating your gods, how do they come to be? So when I created the gods for the world of Tiglath, you have to, I created the first god, which was called Thapeth. Uh, Thapeth, yeah, Thapeth. And uh, I sometimes have even a difficult time pronouncing some of the names of the characters in my worlds. So um, there's that. And I said, that's the first god that sprang into being. And then where did the other gods come from? And I said that um, Thoth Thopeth is both male and female. So he actually mated with himself and brought forth five elemental gods, which were as the god of the air, fire, earth, water, and ether or life. And th with that, I then um, created the five elemental gods and I cr then this makes all the gods except the god of ether female. So that the, the, to, so the god of air, fire, earth, and water, they're all female gods and the god of uh, ether or life is the god is male. So you have to think about if you're going to create your gods and goddesses, which ones are male, which ones are female, which ones are neither or both. And you, you can come up with um, some various things with regard to that. So I created those gods and from those five, the, the, all the rest of the gods were created in by the mating of the god of Aether with one of the, the, the god, uh, one of the goddesses. And that, but the, but Thopeth also then continued to mate with himself and create some other gods. And the way I worded it was that the five elemental gods were appalled at the ugliness of their parent and they conspired to destroy, uh, destroy him rather than allow him to give birth to any more gods. And so, and so the way it was, is, uh, <laughs> Uh, while Thopeth was busy in a masturbatory self-impregnation, the elemental gods used their power to rip their parent apart. And this actually feeds into some of the descriptions you run into, like in Hesiod's Theogony. So that's where, that's why there were no other, quote, primary gods created, but there w but what they didn't know was that there was Thopeth created at least two other gods uh, that are hidden. And the idea behind this is this is like, I like the some of the Cthulhu mythos, which is there that you can introduce hidden gods, which have hidden sources of power, which became a major theme in my world of Tiglath. So that you don't know how many hidden gods there are, what, um, wh who worships them. There are very few texts about them and those texts are blasphemous and perverted. So it, it affects all your uh, relationships. So now I'll, I'll go through um, the description of my, the gods that I created for the world of Tiglath. And I start off creating the, the, that and then uh, I will talk a little bit more after I go through the description and the uh, show you how I found determined how I laid out the interactions. Okay, so this is um, a sheet, a wor worksheet that I did in Excel, which lists the names of the gods in the world of Tiglath, and then uh, here is their primary aspect. And I mentioned that each. Um, God has multiple aspects, but this is their primary aspect. So this, I when I created this, I wanted to create the. I decided on twenty uh, one aspects: air, crops, death, drink. This is in alphabetical order, but it's um, air, fire, earth, uh, water, and aether, 
and uh, which is also fate. Those are the uh, element, what I call the elemental gods, and then you have all the other, other interesting gods. And if you heard my discussion about, um, uh, or there was some discussion about Euthyphro, if you've ever done any story, one of the gods that the, the there's the interesting argument that the god, the Greeks never really honored any of their gods, and you'll hear that, but that's not completely true. The one god that all the Greeks honored was the god of the hearth. And we even see that today in our the phrase keep the home fires burning. Going way back, it was if you've watched the movie Quest for Fire, the you understand that at one point in time when you didn't know how to create fire or you didn't have the technology, you always wanted to keep the home fire, you know, the fire at home burning. So you had the god of the hearth, which was primarily worshipped by the women of the house who uh, uh, maintained the household, who maintained the hearth fire. So I created a god of the hearth. So you actually have 20 gods and then the god of the hearth, which is sort of independent of all those. So this is the this is my list of all my gods by their name. I started to create all the descriptions of each of the gods. Each kingdom in Tiglath uh, this is the continent that the king that the the gods are on, I mean, the continent, and then this is the kingdom that's on that continent. So I, that was the easiest way I could organize them. So that these are the names of all the kingdoms uh, in in the world of Tiglath, and uh, Greth and Marzar are the two. So you have Greth, whose god is the god of money and Marzar, whose god is the god of war. Those are their primary aspects. So then I said, how do the different gods interact? And that feeds in with the concept of creating a theogony. So I, based on my 20, uh, 21 gods, I created an interaction sheet of what god likes what other god. So this is how that they would um, the followers would handle deal with each other if they run into each other. Um, for example, um, the gods of uh, the god of crops. If, if they have a follower and they run into a god of the air who, who's worshiping air, they would persecute them, or they would hate them, or they would like them, or they would dislike them, or they could be indifferent, or they could actually love them. So the god of the hunt loves the god of the air, or actually it's the goddess of the air. But, but So I created this chart which helps define how all the religious groups interact with each other. So this is, this is the easiest way I could figure out how to go from my pantheon to, uh, so with the names of, I created my primary aspects, then I create the names, then you uh, assign the names to each kingdom or each city, if you're going to follow that, because normally a city would have a city god and so on, and then how they interact between them. So this would explain why certain cities, certain countries, would, certain kingdoms would automatically dislike each other because their gods dislike each dislike somebody else. Or they may want to, uh, if they love them, then they would um, want want to have a better relationship with that. If you want to create a pantheon on your own, the first thing is to, to figure out what aspects you want and figure out how the aspects interact with each other to create your relationships between the various sects. And if you search through, uh, just do a search, you know, say, say you want to take a look at the God of Water, pick up and do some, do a Google search on that. And you can find numerous gods and goddesses from various um, different uh, religions in the past that you can steal and steal ideas from. And that's what I basically did is I went through and you would find some interesting descriptions of um, various gods. And for example, the goddess of hate, I um, 
She is hate, strife, and discord personified. I stole the, the, the a lot of these phrases, and I can't remember where I stole them from, but it's a lot of an Lomanis, uh, Lam uh, Lam Uwa stands in the center of um, uh, beach vessels or battlefield and screams. And so uh, the screams harden the hearts of soldiers, removing any thoughts of mercy. And so they no longer remember their fathers or their wives and children and the screams of, with, with the screams of uh, uh, Lamoua uh, ringing in their ears. Uh, she's described as strife insatiable. Her anger is never satisfied. And so I went through and created uh, all the gods and tried to create descriptions of them. And some of them are still a bit rough. Some of them are a little bit more um, fulfilled. Uh, you know, I filled out, out all the, the, the aspects of them. But it's the, you also run into, uh, you know, the, I have the goddess of pain and uh, the, you run into some bizarre combinations, which actually is true if you look at some of those. So um, you, you run into uh, Adoreta, the goddess of war, but she's also the goddess of sexual love, fertility, and warfare. And uh, she's the goddess of love, but not marriage. Uh, she's connected with extra, extramarital uh, sex and sensual affairs. Uh, she supposedly prowls the streets and taverns looking for sexual adventure. Um, so the, she stirs confusion and chaos uh, among those who are disobedient to her, spreading carnage and inciting the devastating flood. Um, it, it is her game to speed conflict and battle. Unto, um, so, and it's an interesting phrase, and I stole this from, I can't remember which mythology, that she the battle itself is sometimes referred to the dance of uh, Idretha. And I have the description of one of my, uh, one of the generals of the army uh, wanting to dance the dance. Uh, it's basically the dance of war. And so you get a very different description of how you fit this in there. So this is how you can fit your pantheon into everyday lives if you want to go that route and how you can have um, them have multiple aspects that they, uh, and how they're created and how they interact. And so uh, hopefully this gives you some ideas. If you're, you know, you can always use some of the, the gods, demigods and heroes uh, that are produced by, uh, that's an old book that in the first edition and um, that there's, um, and even going back to the original Dungeons and Dragons, uh, that there are a variety of different sources you can pick and choose to take into your campaign and update. And I encourage you to merge, shuffle. It's like a deck of cards. Take take some ideas from one and from with one mythology and another mythology, shuffle them together, figure out how you want to do that so you can create the religions that you're interested in running in your campaign. Because as the creator of your world, you need to decide how the religions are going to affect the player characters. And you can do what I've sometimes done, and just go. They don't, <laughs> you know. Most of the most of the characters are sort of, shall we say, uh, uh, agnostic, or they're not really, uh, or they're atheistic. That's a perfectly legitimate approach. But if you want to create the gods, it does create. You're going to have certain followers, and if you like, watch the Game of Thrones and see how dangerous it is when some group of religious fanatics come into power. And um, you can see, do that and you can add those into your campaign and add an interesting depth by having them. And maybe one of your characters will pick up and follow that. Maybe they won't. Maybe they will be, you know, it's it, that's up to the player characters how much they want to follow the religions, and not. But it gives an it gives an interesting depth to your campaign and ha can help explain why certain actions happen. If you like my video, press the thumbs up button. I'd appreciate that. 
or if uh, this interests you, you can always subscribe to my channel. There's a button right above. Uh, I look forward to hearing some comments. Tell me what you think about this and I'll uh, uh, try and reply and uh, we can see if I'll do some more of these. Thank you.